Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. How are you? I'm very well, thank you very much. My hair's still a bit wefty. Oh, it's very sort of misty this morning. It's been misty the last few days. I think we've got a big old change in the weather. Some, some warm weather coming in. Barbecue weather. <clears throat> Not bad for April. We've had most of the showers are out of the way, hopefully. The old daffodils are out all over the place. Everywhere is festooned with daffs. So. How's it going? Things are going quite well for us. We've got a, this challenge of working without a receptionist. And uh, not that I think anyone will, will follow us. I mean, I don't know whether a few private practices might consider re-gearing re their workforce based on the way we're doing things. But I think most busy, you know, practices will see a receptionist as a... Well, they need a receptionist, don't they, really, to cope with all the admin and the paperwork and the regulations and the compliance, inspection and testing and stuff like that. So... Anyway, it's going okay. And in fact, we're doing, we're doing pretty well, you know. We're not saving any money because we're still paying our wages at the moment, but uh, in a couple of months, say three, four months time, it'll be cost effective and it's difficult making a change that's only going to save you money in six months because that seems like so far away, you know. I suppose you tend to concentrate more on the immediate cost savings. Anyway, I've got an interesting conundrum for you today. It's uh, an NHS conundrum. And it's a charges conundrum. It's about a patient who went to an NHS practice and was told they needed a filling, which was going to be about 56 quid or whatever a filling is now on the health service. And were then were then told that the uh, when they left that they needed to pay 256 quid or whatever band three is because the tooth now needed a crown. And uh, they were, in, in their subsequent letter to the principal, said that they were shocked uh, to receive this big bill and it was unexpected and they couldn't afford it. They didn't have the money on them. They didn't have the money anyway. And, uh, you know, and how, could the, how could the practice work, function like that? How could it work like that? So, on the one side, you've got a patient who taken at face value and I know the the uh, your first instinct is to say this is a well-crafted trial but if you read these letters at face value and I think most of them should be taken at face value there was a patient who was genuinely shocked that the bill turned out to be five times what they they expected and then on the other hand You've got a dentist who um, has got a piece of NHS paperwork clearly indicating that the patient was signed a piece of paper on which it was indicated that the, uh, the crown was necessary and that a charge of 240 something or whatever it was was going to be paid. So you've got two apparently contradictory, there's, there's a lot of tension between the two accounts of what's going on here, yeah? You've got the, you know, almost to the extent when you look at this piece of paper and you think, well that, for, for, that, for the letter of complaint to be accurate, that, that signature must be forged, and yet I don't think it is forged. So you have to ask yourself, how do, you, how do people get themselves in such a mess over something as simple as whether or not what, what charge is payable and what uh, treatment is necessary. Now, <clears throat> it hasn't been it hasn't been 
helped at all by, I believe, by the attitude of the receptionist who was who's very much, well, these are NHS charges, we don't set them. We don't have any discretion over whether you have to pay them. If they're statutory charges, you know, and you know what I think about a statutory, uh, statutory uh, instruments, that, that it's the law, you know, it's the law. Um, ignores the the the, the uh, ignores the problem really. You know, you're just hiding behind the statue there. So, as a principal, how would you deal with that? You know, what? How do you approach that? Well, I mean, <clears throat> I've been talking about this guy who's had a veneer come off and now has now broke the veneer. And I think we charged him about 500 for the veneer. And I'm going to recommend that he has a ceramic crown. And I am, I am going to, without thinking, just refund the cost of the veneer, the, the 500 quid. So we'll end up doing a ceramic crown, which will be about, he'll end up paying about another 70 on top. So he'll get a refund of 510, and the ceramic crown is 580, so he'll end up having to pay about another 70 quid to, to change the veneer over for a ceramic. And this veneer has lasted six months. I mean, it's not like it fell off the day it was done, I think. So, to, to deal with a complaint from a patient who says that they're out about 200 quid, by, mean, by virtue of a misunderstanding, assuming that you do accept that it's a genuine misunderstanding, and in, in my, my, my opinion, it appears to be, I don't think this patient is just trying a complaint on to try and get a, a crown done for the cost of a filling, then the idea of just saying, oh, well, forget it, you know, just, just we'll keep the 50 and you can have the crown and, and would that make you happy, you know? That to me is, uh, is a no-brainer. But I can see why in the NHS it's not a no-brainer, right? Because I've worked in the, I've worked in the NHS for a long time. And I know that you can't, you know, your margins are so uh, slim in the NHS that you don't, you're not inclined to write off any money, you know. If you think you can, you can cling on to some money, then you do. Uh, so, uh, and there's this, you know, there's like, well, is the patient, can the patient prosecute this? You know, can they make a case for getting this money back? And it's not helped by the commissioning authorities, who are very much of a private mindset, and the General Dental Council, who are very much of a private mindset, which is just give the patient the money back, you know. And I've been the victim of this myself. I did a gold crown for someone, and uh, I did, and it was a brilliant gold crown, and I'm sure the bloke still got it in his mouth today. And he walked out of the surgery without paying, just said he'd forgotten his wallet. And so we said, all right, then, you know, he said he'll pop back and he didn't, and he didn't, he didn't. And then eventually we took him to the small claims court because, and we were certain, we were certain that we had a cast iron case. We'd done the crown. It was a brilliant crown. There's nothing wrong with it. He hadn't complained about it or anything. All he'd done is just not pay. And we took him to the small claims court and he put down in his defense that, uh, the crown was uncomfortable or something. He made something up, basically. And uh, the magistrate said, well, I don't see why this, he should have to pay if he's not got what he wanted was a comfortable crown. And what he said was he hasn't got a... And what I should have said was he's lying through his teeth. He's can't, there's no basis to his counterclaim. He's just made up a, a reason not to pay. Because he's a, uh, you know, and afterwards he said to me, after he said, no hard feelings, you know, I'm sorry you lost, no hard feelings. And I'm like, no, I, I'm never going to forget this. It's been a lesson to me, an expensive lesson. And since that point, I have never, ever, ever let anyone walk out of the surgery, or not walk in the surgery and get anything fitted unless they paid first. And, and, and anyone who feel like we had a bloke in this week, we started to go lower chrome on him. And I said, he said, how much is it? I said, it's 600 quid. He said, well, and I pay that at the end, do you? I said, no, you pay that at the beginning. Oh, really? I pay that at the beginning? I said, yeah, that's right, yeah. 
So my expenses start at the beginning. So that's when you pay. So that's when I become liable to the technician for any work that I ask him to do. And there's another reason for it as well, and that is that in law, any work that's fitted to a patient becomes their property. So, and, and pretty much as soon as you try it, you know, as soon as it touches their mouth when you fit it, that's when what they call title passes. So uh, you can, um, you know, you can put a set of full, full dentures in a patient's mouth and say, uh, how do they feel? And they'll say, fine. And then uh, they can say, well, I haven't got any money. And you can say, well, that's all right. You leave them here and pick them up when you've, when you've paid. And they'll, they'll, be, they'll be say, but no, these are my dentures. They're, they're, I own these dentures. These are, these, are, these are actually my dentures now. You can't keep them. And they're right. In law, they're right. So nobody ever, no, no work of mine ever touches a patient until they've paid in full. And that you can thank the, uh, that guy who fleeced me out of the cost of one gold crown in the early 1980s for that rule, okay? Well, this surgery is pursuing uh, sort of a similar policy, which is basically what they're saying is that they won't all the time the patient says that they can't pay for the crown, they won't fit the crown. And all the, you know, and they will only um, make an appointment to fit the crown if the patient says, agrees, that on the date that they come in to fit the crown, that they will pay for the crown. And the patient is still at the uh, stage of saying, I, this is, this is, this work on my tooth is so much more than I was expecting, and by implication, so much more than I would have agreed to, you know. So, um, and 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 also, I mean, this piece of paper they've signed. You know, they've had a, you know, they've had a chat with a friend. They've always, they've all got a friend who says that this, they've had this done without informed consent. And to get round that argument, the NHS br has brought in this piece of paper that where they signed to say, yeah. This is what he needs doing, and uh, this is, uh, you know, I understand this is the charge, and I'm going to sign. This is my signature to say that I understood. But in law, it's not. Informed consent doesn't quite work like that. And that's why these stupid pieces of paper are, are, are assumed to mean more than they do. Because lots of patients <laughs> lack lack the mental capacity <laughs> to understand what they're doing and in a way it's, it's a stupid way but it's these it's these idiot patients that you have to protect from themselves you have to assume the job of doing something which is later you know would, would be found to be supportable and just putting a piece of paper in front of them and saying uh, sign here please um, you know it's not not necessarily a cast iron the proof that uh, they did actually understand and, and, because, and here is evidence here is a patient who quite patently did not understand that they were having a crown that they were needed to pay another 200 quid and that, that they'd signed to say that they understood that and then they later write to say no that they didn't understand that and they didn't mention uh, later when questioned the fact that they'd signed a consent I mean you could say well of course they wouldn't because that doesn't support their case but the point is, it's more likely that they just didn't realise that they'd consented. And anyone who doesn't realise that they consented has not given informed consent. So, <laughs> so, how do you deal with it? You know, how would you deal with it? I mean, given that, on, on the face of it, the facts seem to support the dentist's argument that the patient you know, did, did have it explained to them and signed a piece of paper to say that they understood that they were having a crown, then, I mean, I'd just be interested in the first instance just to write back to the patient and send them a copy of the consent form and say, thank you very much for your letter. I'm sorry to hear that there may have been a misunderstanding in this case. And could you could I just please have your comments on the fact that, um, you know, that, that your signature is on this piece of paper, which quite clearly shows that you were um, advised that a crown was necessary and that, uh, that that was the charge payable. And see what they say. And okay, they're probably gonna say, well, I don't 
remember signing that piece, I've never seen that piece of paper before in my life. I was just told to sign it, I didn't read it, etc, etc. Um, and what you're doing is you're just delaying the inevitable, which is the inevitable is that, you know, you're almost certainly going to need to refund the money. I mean, you could, you could stick it out and say, I'm sorry, uh, you know, it, it, this is a statutory charge and it's due and therefore, uh, you know, my hands are tied. We'll have to take it up with the Secretary of State for Health. They are the House of Commons Health Select Committee. They are the ones that oversee the, the regime that introduces the charges. And at the end of the day, they are, you know, assuming they're getting a half decent crown, they're getting a bargain anyway, which is what rankles so much, you know, when you're working on the NHS and trying to do decent quality work for roughly one third of the free market price. I can understand why, why people do get upset when the patients won't pay. There is a, there is a tremendous uh, sense of entitlement, you know, even amongst the, uh, I don't know who's more, who feels more entitled, the, the bunch of patients who get it for nothing or the bunch of patients who get it at one third of the market price. They're all very, uh, but then you'd expect that, you know, I always said this, if you're gonna give 10 pound notes away for a fiver, or 15 pound notes away for a fiver, which is basically what, what NHS dentists do, then, um, then of course patients are going to complain if that arrangement comes under any, if, you, if there's a, a hint of a suggestion that the, that sort of arrangement might come under threat. Uh, but all these patients that are getting £10 notes for a fiver are going to be extremely vocal in their opposition to any changes to the scheme from which they benefit so handsomely. And, uh, but if you're, the, if you're on the other side of that deal, if you're the one who's giving away £10 notes for a fiver, um, then you have to be merciless. You just have to, you have to stop that scheme straight away. Any scheme where you're giving away ten pound notes for a fiver, you have to stop that scheme straight away. Yeah, you either have to charge a tenner for a tenner, or you have to give away a fiver for a fiver. And on the NHS, you can't give away a fiver for a fiver. The NHS. The NHS are very insistent that, you know, the quality of your work, quality of the materials, quality of the laboratory work, etc. should be of a, of a, a reasonably high standard. And so you don't, uh, you don't get a chance to downgrade the service too much. And I think that's, that goes to the fundamental root of it all. You know, the problems with the health service. They're just trying to, they promise too much and then they don't. And, and the dentists are getting themselves into trouble trying to deliver I think I had a patient, this patient who came in yesterday, the 600 pound dentures, um, we're making him a chrome denture and he's got a, a rochette bridge which keeps falling out. So I said to him, I'll just include that in the, in the, uh, in the design of the, the chrome. And so you can throw this stupid bridge which you're going to inhale one day and it's going to entail a lung operation to get it back out. You can throw it away. So we, we took it off and it had got like, it's got three layers of super glue underneath this rush hair bridge where he's been sticking it in. Plus the original composite that was probably used to glue it in, you know, in, in 1978. And, um, and I said to him, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll give those teeth a clean up. Oh, he oh, nearly jumped out of the chair. Oh, oh, that's another 107 pounds, isn't it? And I said, no. <laughs> He says, yes, he says, your receptionist told me if I wanted to have my teeth cleaned, it'd be 107 pounds. I said, it's 107 pounds for a checkup and a clean up. It's 58 for the checkup, 49 to see the hygienist. I said, that's, that's a, a sort of a professional cleaning of your teeth. I said, all I'm suggesting is that we, <laughs> when we take this bridge out, and before I take the impression for the denture, because it's so accurate, I'll just clean up these three teeth. I said, there's no charge. So, okay, all right, no, and then he gets back in the chair again. So then I said, uh, and, then, and then when he came to pay, he paid the, the 600 whatever, and he said to me now, but, but that is that it? Is that, you know, I mean, if, if uh, you know, we need to do an extra try-in or uh, a bit of adjustment post facto, is that all included? I'm not, you're not gonna come back to me and ask me for any more money, are you? And I said, no, no, we are, we're very clear about our flat rate fee policy. They're all 
it's all inclusive. Everything's everything that sort of could reasonably be included is included. Yeah. So you've got a patient there who's um, who's who's obviously ultra sensitive about money. You know, is is not even got 10p more than he's budgeted for for this treatment and appreciates our flat rate approach so if we have to do an x-ray we just we just do an x-ray we don't charge him like say oh i've got an x-ray another 12 quid i'm afraid it's all included right it's a flat rate fee once you've paid it then you've paid it you get you get the job done even if we do need to do things like keep cementing temporarily cementing your rochette bridge in and out at the trying stage and all this um and uh, I think th there are patients like this, you know, who, who who can find 56 quid but can't find 250. And if a, if a filling turns into a crown, it's a financial disaster for them. And, uh, and you have to sort of uh, say, well, look, you need a crown, but you can't afford it. So what do you do? Then you need a policy. What do you do if a patient needs a crown, but they can't afford it? Do you, you temporise, put a big, big old filling in, you know, and say, right, well, we'll do the crown later. What they shouldn't have done is they shouldn't have gone ahead with the crown just on the assumption that it's a statutory charge and that the patient would have no choice but to find the money. And there's obviously some miscommunication there. And I think whoever did that was remiss in... in the patient should never be shocked. They should never be surprised. There should be no unpleasant surprises in dentistry, uh, either from the clinical point of view, the, the pain control point of view, or the financial point of view. Okay, which is also the pain control point of view. <laughs> so I'm going to write back and tell this guy just to refund the money, you know, just really, honestly, it's not. And look at his procedures and try and find out why this patient arrived at, at the end of the treatment and was surprised in any way, shape or form about what happened subsequently. Um, that shouldn't have happened and that's a failure of the practice. Okay, all right, nice to talk to you. I'm off to work and I hope you are too and have a nice day. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye.